Cleopatra was the most powerful and influential woman of her time. But did you know that Cleopatra was not even her real name? It was a title given to the female rulers of Ptolemaic Egypt. Cleopatra was the last of her name and the only Cleopatra who had historical significance. She was a woman drunk on power which drove her to do unthinkable things. To put things in perspective, many people have compared her with Cersei Lannister from the Game of Thrones series. Cleopatra is described by history as many things and in this video, today on Crunch, we'll be looking through her time as one of Egypt's most evil leaders. A Queen with the Right Qualities Let's begin with a little backstory. Cleopatra succeeded her father Ptolemy XII very early in her life at 18. She was a very keen learner and her knowledge was vast. Growing up in the palace, she had access to the best education in her days. She was very properly grounded academically and culturally. She was multilingual and according to historical accounts, she could speak between five and nine languages, including her native Greek, Egyptian, Arabic, and Hebrew. In fact, she was the only member of her family that learned the Egyptian language. Unlike her Ptolemaic predecessors who spoke Greek and observed Greek customs, Cleopatra identified as a true Egyptian pharaoh. She learned the Egyptian language and commissioned portraits of herself in the traditional Egyptian style. Medieval Arab texts praise Cleopatra for her accomplishments as a mathematician, chemist, and philosopher. She was said to have written scientific books and, in the words of the historian Al Masudi, was a sage, a philosopher who elevated the ranks of scholars and enjoyed their company. Unlike any other woman before her, she had a commanding presence, striking personality, sharp intelligence, and impeccable negotiation skills. The Beginning of Her Reign When her father Ptolemy XII died in 51 BC, Cleopatra, being the eldest child, was to succeed him. According to the culture in Ptolemaic Egypt, female rulers were allowed to ascend the throne only if a dominant male ruler reigned alongside them. Also, incest was practiced in the Ptolemaic dynasty to keep their Macedonian Greek bloodline pure. So Cleopatra married her brother who became Ptolemy XIII. At the time of their marriage, Cleopatra was 18 and her brother Ptolemy XIII was 10 years old. The Clever Mastermind Cleopatra felt the throne of Egypt was hers by every right, and she saw no reason for her not to be the dominant ruler. She was born to be queen and she had all the qualities required. It helped that Ptolemy XIII was a child when they were coronated as king and queen. This meant she was ruling the all of Egypt on her own and Ptolemy was just a figurehead on standby. Cleopatra's solo reign continued until three years after their marriage, and by this time, Ptolemy XIII had grown. He was old enough to conceive the idea of selfishly wanting to control Egypt and to see that the only thing standing in his way was Cleopatra. The Ptolemy and Cleopatra had a fallout and a civil war ensued. During the civil war, Cleopatra was dethroned and replaced by her half-sister Arsinoe IV. In the real sense, Arsinoe and Ptolemy XIII formed an alliance against Cleopatra and launched the siege of Alexandria, the capital city of Egypt at the time. The siege was obviously targeting Cleopatra who had gone into hiding to execute her own plans. For generations in the Ptolemaic dynasty, family members have looked out for themselves and their selfish wishes to claim the throne. This has led to siblings murdering each other, parents going to war with their children, and children killing their parents. Cleopatra, who was well aware of this history, had made a plan for when her siblings would turn on her. She was several steps ahead and had acquired a secret weapon in her corner, an alliance with the ruler of the Roman Republic, Julius Caesar. At Cleopatra's request, the Roman army was deployed to Egypt, and they fought against the Ptolemy's forces until the siege of Alexandria was lifted. The Ptolemy's troops and the Roman army went head-to-head -head in the Battle of the Nile, and the former was dealt a great blow. Ptolemy XIII drowned in the Nile shortly after his defeat. Arsinoe was captured and paraded through Alexandria in golden chains before being exiled to the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus. Cleopatra got rid of all her competitors, regained her position as queen, and was once again in control of Egypt. To satisfy the demands of their culture, she married her youngest brother, Ptolemy XIV, who succeeded Ptolemy XIII as her co-ruler. At the time of their marriage, Ptolemy XIV was just about 12 years old. 
Just like the Ptolemy before him, Ptolemy XIV reigned in name alone, with Cleopatra keeping actual authority. The Enchantress Cleopatra was always very thorough and hardly made any move that was not calculated. She had chameleon-like characteristics and she knew how to change into whatever was needed depending on the situation. She lived in a man's world but she wanted it all so what did she do? She used men, the most powerful of them. Egypt was an extremely prosperous country in her days and the only formidable competition was Rome. In her quest to take charge of Rome, she seduced and manipulated two of the most powerful men in Rome, Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. Cleopatra and Julius Caesar Cleopatra and Caesar appear to have a transactional relationship. He helped her win her family's civil war and she helped his cause by assisting him with the wealth and army of Egypt. They each helped the other person secure their reign. However, in the course of their relationship as allies, Cleopatra seduced Julius Caesar, and he got emotionally attached to her despite her marriage to Ptolemy XIV. They had a secret love affair that produced a child, a son who she named Caesarion. After he had helped her secure Egypt, Caesar invited Cleopatra to his mansion in Rome. Her plan was working. She arrived in Rome with her son Caesarion and stayed there for about two years. She was Caesar's favorite concubine and she was treated as such. She had access to very important places in Rome including the places of decision making and the bedchambers of the soon to be emperor of Rome. She was the queen of Egypt and she was fast gaining relevance in Rome as well. Caesar and Cleopatra's relationship grew so much that they didn't even try to hide it anymore. Caesar erected a statue of her in public places such as the temple of Venus Genetrix. She was so influential that her fashion set a trend that the Roman women began to follow after. Her exotic hairstyle and pearl jewelry became a fashion trend. According to the historian Joanne Fletcher, so many Roman women adopted the Cleopatra look that their statuary has often been mistaken for Cleopatra herself. Cleopatra's presence in Rome caused a stir that no one could ignore. Some members of the Roman Senate were displeased by the idea of a foreign woman having as much influence as she had in their affairs and with the general Roman citizens. To make things worse, Cleopatra was spreading the news that her son Caesarion was Caesar's true heir. This turn of events, coupled with long-standing issues they had with Caesar and his administration, resulted in some of the senators assassinating him. In 44 BC, when Julius Caesar was killed, Cleopatra and her son fled the city of Rome and went back to Egypt. Upon arriving in Egypt, Cleopatra poisoned her brother Ptolemy XIV to prevent history from repeating itself and installed her son Caesarion as Ptolemy XV. Cleopatra and Mark Antony After fleeing from Rome, Cleopatra's world domination plan was not completely aborted. What happened was just a setback that she soon found her way around. Her next stepping stone was another important Roman who was a friend of Caesar's, Mark Antony. Mark Antony was a powerful general in the Roman army. After the Liberator's Civil War, Mark Antony was assigned to oversee the administration of the eastern provinces of the Roman Republic, which is modern-day Turkey. Basically, he was one of the three most powerful people at the time. The other two were Caesar's grandnephew and heir Octavian and Lepidus, a Roman statesman. After his assignment as administrator of the Eastern Territories, Mark Antony summoned Cleopatra to question her and find out what was her part in the assassination of Caesar. She showed up later than expected to heighten Mark Antony's anticipation. Her arrival made quite the statement as she showed up with gifts, a large company of musicians and servants, and expensive and attractive robes and fragrances. She literally showed up looking like a goddess, and her arrival had a striking effect on Antony. After their business had ended, Mark Antony had been swayed by Cleopatra's seductiveness. He was so head over heels in love with her that he accompanied her back to Egypt, where they lived a life of debauchery together. They had an 11-year-long love story and three children together, despite Antony's other marriages, one of them being with the sister of the soon-to-be Emperor of Rome. Cleopatra's relationship with Mark Antony was as transactional as it was intimate. The Egyptian queen's benefits from their relationships were an expansion of her territory, basically more power. 
Mark Antony assigned parts of Syria, Lebanon, and Jericho to her rule. Cleopatra offered the financial assistance necessary to fund his Parthian campaign in exchange. Apart from acquiring more lands to rule over, Cleopatra had Mark Antony order for the execution of her sister Arsinoe. All her competitors were finally out of the picture. Or were they? Over time, the new soon-to-be Emperor of Rome, Octavian, noticed Antony's alliance with Egypt. He already thought Cleopatra was a threat to him after she claimed that her son, Ptolemy XV, whom she had with Caesar, was the rightful heir of the dead Roman ruler and not Octavian. He was further threatened by Antony's relationship with her and warned Antony to change his ways. Eventually, he lost it and unleashed war against Alexandria, but specifically Mark Antony and his wife, Cleopatra. The war situation didn't turn out well for the lovebirds, and they ended up taking their own lives. Cleopatra's story doesn't end well. When it was obvious that Octavian had the upper hand in the war, knowing what he would do if she were captured, Cleopatra took her life. She wasn't going to let Octavian make a public spectacle of her. She lived and died on her own terms. Her country was caught up in her quest for more and more power. She wiped out her entire family, undoing the security of her dynasty that her predecessors had gone to great lengths to establish. She seduced Mark Antony away from his carrying his duty to his country until she had him in the palm of her hands. In the end, there was absolutely nothing to show for her evils. At the end of the war, her four children were killed, her city was ruined, and the Roman Empire took over her kingdoms. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe if you want to learn more about history on Crunch. Thanks for watching.